In this section, we're going to look at 5.1 uh, PDFs, probability distribution functions, and 5.2, we'll look at expected values. So let's start off with defining random variables here, look at some characteristics of it. And so I'm going to use an example to talk about this. And so let's uh, consider flipping a coin three times. Now, what are the number of outcomes that we could have here? The multiplication rule told us that for every choice uh, we have, so two choices for flipping the first coin, two choices for flipping the second, and then two choices for flipping the third. If we multiply those, that'll give us a total number of uh, outcomes here. And so an easier way to make a sample space if you don't want to use a tree diagram uh, is since we know there's eight uh, outcomes, I'll go ahead and write four heads, four tails. Then I'll half that again, two heads, two tails, two heads, two tails, and then we'll go half again. And this is a nice systematic way to get the entire sample space here. So there's going to be eight of them, and the multiplication rule ensures that I do actually get all of them there. So a random variable, uh, it gives an outcome a numerical value. It's going to assign a value uh, to the, uh, the, um, the outcomes that we're going to uh, come up with here. We're going to actually make some events. So what we're going to consider here is we're going to keep track of the number of heads that we get. So then uh, we're going to make a probability distribution function here, which is kind of just a table. Uh, with the uh, what we're keeping track of and its probability. So we could either get zero heads, one heads, two heads, or three heads. That's the total number. Uh, that's the max we could get because we're only flipping the coin three times. And so the probabilities associated with that, well, zero heads, there's only tails, tails here. Um, one heads, there's going to be three of those. So that's going to be three out of eight. And then two heads, again, we got three out of eight. And then uh, all three heads, we're going to have one out of eight as well there. So a couple of things that a probability distribution function is that uh, the summation of all the probabilities should equal to one, which we could see here from the, our table. And also, each probability should be between zero and one. So that's indicating about each of these guys right here. They should each be uh, less than one because that's the grand total what they should add up to. We don't want to end up with over 100%. So this random variable breaks up our sample space into disjoint events, collectively adding up to one. And so it's a nice way to quantify some data because I can't really do any math with tails, heads, heads, and heads, tails, heads. So we assign a random variable, in this case, keeping track of the number of heads that we have. And the expected value is going to be the summation of x times p of x. So that just means we're going to multiply each uh, uh, possible outcome here times its probability. So we're multiplying these guys, these guys, all together here. And then we're going to go ahead and add them up. And that's what's happening right here. And just to be correct on our notation, we should technically have some uh, subscripts here, uh, subscripts of I there. Uh, but we're going to just be a little, uh, a little informal and just write it out like this without the subscripts. And so the expected number of heads that we would get would be 1.5. Now note, the expected value is a mean, so it's fine that it could have a decimal value. Okay, so let's look at this example here. And so we're keeping uh, track of um, Nancy has three classes um, uh, three days a week. So she has some classes here uh, three days a week. And then here's are the probabilities associated of how many she would attend. So she attends three. That's an 80% chance. Uh, two is 15. Then one is four. And then none of them would be 1% of the time. And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to suppose a one week uh, is randomly selected here. And so we want to know, uh, first of all, let's identify what the random variable is in this case. And it's whatever we're keeping track of. 
Um, X is going to be the number of days she goes to a class here. And what values can it take on? Well, 0, 1, 2, or 3, because the max she has is those three classes there. Um, so let's make the probability distribution uh, function here. So our PDF table. And so we're going to have all the values X could take on, and then we're going to have the probabilities associated with them. So again, 80%, uh, 15%, 4%, and 1%. Now we're going to write that as a decimal. And it should add up to one whole. And we want to know what the expected number of days she would attend right in a given week here. So here's our formula, but again, we're going to try to be a bit more intuitive here. And what we're going to do is we're just going to multiply uh, x times its probability. So each of those outcomes times its probability here. So I'm going to extend the table outwards. And that's going to make it easier to be able to add these downwards. So I multiply across, then I end up adding downwards. And that's what the summation is. So about 2.74 days. Again, that's fine that it's a decimal because we're talking an average here, expected value. What if I wanted to find out the standard deviation? This is another characteristic of data. And so this formula is a little bit longer here. So sigma is equal to the summation. Now, again, the difference between each value and the mean, and then we're going to square that times its probability. And so the expected value is mu, is the mean here. So I'm going to extend this table out. I'm going to find out what the difference is squared and multiply it by the probability here. So I'm going to get each of the data values, and I'm going to subtract 2.74, which is the mean. We're going to square it and then multiply it by its probability here. Okay, so we're using this one uh, in here, and then we're going to use the probability at the end there. And we're going to do that for all of them, so you can start seeing the pattern here. And then what we're going to do with these, similar to how we did the uh, expected value, how we summed them up, we're going to want to do the same thing here. And we're going to want to go ahead and add these guys downwards. And so what we have here is going to be, um, uh, technically, it's the variance right here. And we need to take the square root in order to get the standard deviation, which is going to be about 0.58. So this table gives us a nice way to organize our data, again, not relying so heavily on the formulas. Let's calculate the expected value. Um, here we have a game that we're playing um, with a biased coin. So uh, probability of getting heads and tails are not, di are not the same. They're going to be different here. And so kind of a simple game here if you... Um, if you lose, you pay $6, and if you win, you get $10. So we're going to want to make a table here to organize this. So we're going to write wins, losses, and again, we're going to use the outcomes here and then a P of X. So using that probability distribution function set up. And so the random variable here is the money. That's what we're keeping track of, how much we win or lose. So if we win... We win 10 bucks. If we lose, we're going to be down $6. So I'm denoting that by a negative 6. And then the probabilities associated with it are one third and two thirds. So for the expected value, again, we're going to extend this table out where we're going to want to multiply these across here so we could add them. And that's going to be our expected value in this case here. So we multiply across. And then we end up adding downwards. Notice I didn't even write the formula here. We're just kind of doing it by the table. And so this is going to be about negative uh, 67 cents. Now, again, the negative indicates that the game is not in our favor. 
if we play this over a long period of time, every time we play, well, we expect it to lose about 67 cents. So, so you might win some, you might lose some, but long term, this is what's going to happen every time the game is played. So uh, the question here is, if you play the game many times, will you come out ahead? And it's no. On average, long term, we would lose about 67 cents per game. And this is how most casinos make their money. Again, for every dollar that's played there, uh, they only win a small amount. That's the expected value. They pay out, they get some in. But long term, on every dollar, think about how many dollars are being played there, how many games, 24 hours a day, all the small amount tends to add up.